Well, I want to sing a little prayer. It's in Tibetan, um, but it's expressing two ideas, really. Because I suppose if you think about it, a prayer is uh, words and words are thoughts. And actually, we're going to talk about this tonight. Really, you could say Buddha's expertise is the mind, how the mind works and how to change it. That's what you're trying to do is be your own therapist, as one of my teachers would say. So these thoughts that we're expressing in this first two lines, maybe for somebody in this room who might figure they're a Buddhist, but it's kind of reiterating your reliance on the Buddha and his way of life. The second two lines could be for all of us. And um, it's expressing a, a motor, an, an, uh, an altruistic reason for our sitting here together. Kind of thinking, okay, we're here together, hour or so, hour and a half, see what happens. Listening to a few ideas, and including me, even though I'm talking, I'm listening, uh, to see if there's some useful tools here. Because it needs to be practical. If it's not practical, it's a waste of time. Don't even listen, you know. It's got to be practical. Um, tools for what? To use it in your own self, in your mind, in your being, in your life, to help you become less neurotic, less stressed, less miserable, and hopefully more kind, more wise, and more appropriate and useful on this earth, you know. Bare minimum this. Somehow thinking this way. There's this nice analogy the Buddha has that a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. And I suppose you could say the compassion wing is the point. It's like the political wing where you get out there and you put your money where your mouth is and you make, you know, you'll be useful. Uh, but it's based on the wisdom wing, which is where you put yourself together. We can't help a dog if we can't help ourselves, you know. So we've got to do the inner work and then on that, to that extent we can do the outer work. So, um, yeah, with that in mind, I'll sing this little prayer. Sange chadang soke chognam la jam chu badu dang ni kyab suchi dagi chanyen gi pe sonam ki dro la penchir sange drupa shok Sange chadang soke chognam la jam chu badu dang ni kyab suchi Dagi chen yen gi pe sonam ki dro la penchir sange drupa shok sange chadang soke chognam la chang chu badu dagni kyab suchi dagi chen yen gi pe sonam ki dro la penchir sange drupa shok So during my own life, I was born of a Catholic in Australia and loved God and Our Lady and the saints and but didn't quite know what to do with all that in myself, you know. And then by the time I was 15, I kind of heard a Billie Holiday record and wondered who, wondered who he was. Uh, somehow I, was, I liked the idea of this jazz and that blew my mind. It opened me up more to sort of social. The whole black experience really opened my mind to human beings' experiences. And then when I was 19, I decided that it was, I prefer boys to God. So goodbye God, hello boys, you know. And I didn't have guilt, so there's no, there no drama in the decision. And then, I, so that was the 60s, ripe and ready for revolution. So then off to London, my mother sent me off there to continue studying singing. She was my singing guru, basically. And, uh, but then forgot all about that and got into sex, drugs and jazz, more sex and more drugs and jazz. I didn't like rock and roll. And then somehow political, you know, I moved quite quickly. So sort of radical left politics, black politics, feminist politics. And I think in my own mind all the time, almost instinctively, I didn't articulate it too much. I wanted happiness, you know, absolutely. But I, don't, I, I didn't equate it with having a house and partners and babies. It just didn't occur to me. I never gave it up. I just didn't want it, you know. It, I think without sounding too grand, I wanted, uh, definitely wanted freedom. And I wanted the truth. I wanted, to understand, I wanted a way to understand the world. So I think all my life I was looking for a way to understand the world. So here I am being a Buddhist, and so that's since the 70s, and all I can say is so far so good, attempting to listen to it, internalise it, and try to use it as tools in my life. Because if I don't try to do that, I'm really being inauthentic, aren't I, you know? So for me, the, the thing that I, that I appreciated most and that I still appreciate most is, uh, as I mentioned briefly, in my words, that Buddha's expertise being the mind, understanding this human mind of ours. So we, we're, we're great at this. In our culture, since, you know, Freud and those people, we've got this amazing insight into the way the mind works and there's so much interest in looking into your mind and becoming better people, using these tools, you know. But it was interesting, recently I read, that was the Dalai Lama said that it was the Hindus, maybe 3,000 years ago, who really began this incredible conversation about self, the nature of self. And it was they who, who, who came up with these 
totally marvellous psychological techniques called, these days called mindfulness or known as concentration meditation. These remarkable techniques that enable a person to really plumb the depths of their own mind. And if we compare that with the materialist view of the mind, then, you know, then to plumb the depths of mind that we don't even posit as existing in our, certainly in our materialist views of self and psychology. And so Buddha came out of that tradition and he kind of went in slightly different directions and out of this has come what we call Buddhism, you know, Buddha's views of the world. So basically he was a regular guy like you and me and this is the major difference probably we could say if we think of a religious, an established system, a religious system, you know. Uh, they're usually uh, positing a creator. Therefore, those teachings, whether it be Islam or Christianity, they're to be believed, and I'm not criticising that. God is the creator. God made the universe. God made the laws of the universe. God is the boss, you know, so I have faith. And I think that's an amazing view. I attempted to do that as a Catholic. Um, but the Buddha's view is not this. On the face of it, you know, look at me. I'm a nun. I sang a prayer. It sounds the same, doesn't it? Uh, and Buddha talks about subtler things, not about soul. He doesn't use that word. He talks about a consciousness or mind. He uses the word mind. But he's got this radically different view of what the mind is and he's come from a very different uh, situation. He was a regular person who became an enlightened being, all these words we use, you know. So he, the approach in Buddhism then isn't a belief system of information coming from on high that in its nature is mysterious. It's coming from his own direct experience, his own observation, so it's not a joke to say you could, you could argue that Buddha's more like a scientist from the point of view of his approach. That he, what he presents as Buddhism, and this is, you know, and so I'm presenting here, if I'm being authentic, and I'm hoping I am being, uh, that is, is Buddha's findings, not something that was revealed to him, not something therefore to be believed, something to be listened to, and if you choose, because you're the boss, not Buddha, because Buddha does not assert a creator, um, then taken on board in your life, and then you and the, in, and the process of practicing something. It's true, isn't it? Is that you, you take it as your experience, but at the same time you're verifying it. And I find that approach kind of rigorous, and I, I really like that approach. So I never use. I don't say I have faith in Buddhism. I, I think it's, we can get very cheap and easy, you know, uh, intellectually lazy as well. I, I prefer to say, which I think is, is the scientific way of saying it, I taking I'm taking Buddhism as my working hypothesis, you know. So Buddha's view about the mind, which I find extremely helpful and appealing, is that it's, and it's radically different. We use this word, but you might as well use another word. He's so different in his view of what mind is. First of all, you know, we refer to our brain roughly. We equate that with mind. Um, for the Buddha, it's not physical, very clear. But he doesn't use the word soul or spirit, interestingly. He keeps using the word mind, or he uses the word consciousness. So first of all, your mind or your consciousness is not physical. Second, and this is a bit of a surprise to us, because we assume that either you came from a creator or some source, maybe we don't think about these things, but if, you, if you're part of the established religions, you're the, you're the product of God. God gave you a soul. Or if you're a materialist, mummy and daddy made you. Well, Buddha disagrees with both those views. He has no disagreement that, you, that your body came from your mother and father. I mean, they worked pretty hard to get that egg and sperm together, I'm quite sure, you know. But that's not, as far as Buddha's concerned, that's not, that's not your mind. So that, this really needs some kind of thinking because we so assume it is, you know. But the Buddha says it doesn't come from your parents, doesn't come, is not physical. And indeed, if we, you know, as I mentioned, taking these views from the Hindus, and these marvellous psychological techniques that enable you to plumb to the depths of your own mind, way more subtle, more refined levels of mind or consciousness or cognition, like I said, that we don't even posit as existing, that to the point where we would think, we would assume it's mysterious because we don't know it in an ordinary sense, you know. But so the mind goes to much more subtle levels, at more refined levels of cognition. And the other thing was, so that if we don't, come from our mummy or daddy, then where, where do we, we would ask, well, where do I Who am I and where do I come from? And this indeed is exactly what Buddha deals with. But the mind, basically, the, the term they use in Buddhism, and I'm getting to, the, this is getting to stress, okay? It's the point. Um, uh, your consciousness, your mind, you think of it as like, they use a term in Buddhism as mental continuum or your I like to think of it as a river of mental moments. And it's used actually in Buddhism in a very subjective way, very experiential, rather than referring to a physical thing that does things. It's, it's like moment by moment, that's your mind. 
that's your mind, you know. And because also in the more esoteric teachings in Buddhism, which is similar to the Hindus, that they where they talk about the subtler physical energies, the, the subtler prana, the wind energies, the subtler nervous system, and this is a similar system that the Tibetan medical system uses, and this is the esoteric teachings in Buddhism, Vajrayana, Tantrayana, where the great meditators deeply, subtly, you know, know their, 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 their subtler physical and mental energies. And this plays a really big role in understanding the way the mind works in the more advanced stages of Buddhist practice. Anyway, this mind of ours is, is, is a river of mental moments. You track it back, you know. Today's moment, thoughts and feelings naturally, inexorably come from yesterday's, which come from the day before. And it's a, an unbroken chain of mental moments. We're not aware of most moments, but we know logically, even if we're asleep in the night, we know we didn't die for seven hours and wake up again. We know our consciousness was there, unconscious, but it was there somehow, ticking away, you know. So this unbroken chain of mental moments that goes right back for the Buddha. And then you get back to the first second of conception, well, you know the second before that, your egg and sperm was in mummy and daddy's bodies, but your consciousness came from a previous moment of its own continuity, its own entity. So this is where the Buddha's view of reincarnation, not just some hippie trippy idea, it's actually part of his whole view of who we are and where we come from. And it's the basis of Buddhist practice, actually. So, okay, the mind. There's different ways of talking about how your mind functions. And in Buddhist psychology, that we, they talk about you've got your sensory consciousness, you know, that part of your mind that functions through the medium of the eyeball, the ears, and so on. But the real one where the workshop is, as Lama Zopa says, uh, my teacher, and the, yeah, he, he says that the, the workshop is in the mind. This is the mental consciousness. And this is what you're attempting to become familiar with if you're trying to be a Buddhist, you know. You study the Buddhist model of the mind because on the one side, the words, the contents of this mental consciousness of ours sound very familiar, Dis, you know, sim, simplistic even. Buddha talks about we've got positive, negative and neutral states in this consciousness of ours. The positive, we all know them, love, compassion, kindness, goodness, joy, fulfilment, contentment, you know, compassion, patience, all these things. They're words we use so easily and we feel we know so well. But this is the stuff of Buddhist psychology. Then you've got this other category, and he would simply refer to them as negative, you know, let's say neurotic states of mind. He would have liked that term if he'd spoken Greek, you know. Um, these, these ones we know well too. Anger, fear, low self-esteem, depression, jealousy. But if we study seriously, you know, psychology in our culture, we would tend to use, we have all these other phrases we use now for serious psychological problems, let's say. But Buddha has never varied in two and a half thousand years in describing our mental illnesses, the sources of all our problems, our stress, our dramas, our loathing, our hate, the source of why people suffer on this earth, the source of why they harm others. He's, he's un, un, you know, the, the view in Buddhism is that's the neurotic stuff. You can, you can use words like bipolar and all these new words we're coming up every day, you know, that's valid. But the Buddhist view doesn't change, you know. And the basis of it, which, and these things seem very simplistic to us somehow, but what I found, attempting to put this stuff into practice myself, knowing these words for these years and saying the same words that I might have said 30 years ago, but hopefully a little bit more meat on the bones of them, kind of getting more of an experience of them. Simple words. I mean, one of my other teachers, Lama Yeshi, says I could tell you about the mind for our, about attachment, for example. It's such a cute word we all use. For a whole year, we'll never begin to understand it until we start going deeply inside, being our own therapists, as Lama Yeshi puts it. So being your own therapist in Buddhism is really the job of being a Buddhist. You could say that, actually. It's the very heart of it. But, but we can use that word very easily. So let's just, you know, if one of you is a therapist and I were to go to you, and because most of us, even if we might be spiritual, we tend to take on board our materialist view that I came from my mother and father, that the past events are the main source of what I am, that the way they treated me, the way my friends treated me, my enemies treated me, my genes, my DNA, all these are the things that we feel are the main uh, factors that play roles in my suffering or indeed in my happiness. And certainly understanding the nature of my brain, you know, all these things. Well, you ask a great meditator in Tibet who's been sitting in one of the, her caves for 30 years, becoming profoundly familiar with her own mind and unpacking and unravelling and radically changing it, which is the point, to, to develop it to perfection, which Buddha says we can all do. You ask her where her brain is and she wouldn't have a clue. She's never heard of a brain. It's not part of the model, you know. So she knows her mind, though. 
So being your own therapist, what would that imply? If I go to you, you'd, you'd go into the past and get me to sort out my things of this happened, this happened, that happened, in order to understand myself now. Well, the way that you'd be your own therapist as a Buddhist is to go into using these, first of all, these concentration meditation techniques that, like I said, the Hindus created them, you know, Buddha ran with them. And they're this totally marvellous, disciplined, enormously difficult extremely focused psychological technique. It's not some hippy trippy mystical thing which we tend to think as soon as we say the word meditation, you know. <clears throat> but it needs enormous discipline in order to get some results from it. And the result from it, it's called often in terms of its result, which is often called single pointed concentration. So when you sit there for a few minutes, you know, watching your breath, the really simple technique that's so familiar in our world now, this is the beginnings of this type of technique. But we tend to, we, we think we just do it and we do it for a little bit and hopefully some peace will come and then we go up and do, get breakfast, you know. But it, it's, it's actually a technique that goes to, it enables you to go way beyond, when you're doing it in a really disciplined, proper way, to go way beyond the gross level of the constant, unceasing chatter that's up there, you know. We can have moments of not much chatter, but we're talking here about a really rigorous um, accomplishment of a state of mind much more subtle, such that you can get it every day again, like you've perfected it, you know. And there's good reason to get this, not just, it itself has marvellous results, but that's just the beginning. The, the real point of this is now on the basis of then learning Buddha's model of the mind, which is quite distinct, quite specific to the Buddha, understanding exactly these positive states, the negative ones in particular, and how they function exactly. And in particular, in the first stages, getting very familiar with the so-called negative states of mind. Why? Not to make us more miserable, but in order to identify the source of the problem. Because Buddha's key point in all his philosophy, and this is where his view of karma comes in, which is his view of explaining the universe, is that the main source of happiness and the main source of suffering in any individual being the main source, it's quite simple, is not the external event, is not the rapist, is not the beloved mother, is not the million dollars in the bank, is not the lack of a million dollars in the bank, is not the debt, is not all the stuff that we assume is the cause of our suffering or that we assume is the cause of our happiness. But so instinctively held within us that we don't question those assumptions, you know. Buddha's view, and then indeed when one goes into this in more depth, slowly taking this on board and it sounds easy but it's immensely difficult because it's absolutely against the grain, you know, is that the main source is in our own mind. So even sometimes as soon as we hear this, it tends to sound like blame, you know, because we desperately want to find something out there to attach the, the source of the problem on. So there are external conditions. People do rape us. People are kind to us. There's no question. Look at the world. It's an unbearably suffering place. You know, talk about stress. Actually, I blew my mind. I read a Newsweek a couple, a few issues ago. It completely blew my mind. In 2010, the last year they've got figures, on this earth, or the number, there were 680,000 or something, what they call unnatural deaths from terrorism, war, violence, whatever. There were 800,000 suicides. That totally blew my mind. I could not believe this, you know. That's just unbearable pain, you know. Because why? Because what we're just talking about right here, where we truly feel that we're stuck with who we are, we truly feel we're stuck with this brain that we're born with, we truly feel that I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault, and it's all out there. It's so instinctive within us. It's, it's so instinctive within all of us. Buddha calls this being in samsara. He says that's what it means, not some place, you know. But it's a state of mind. And the way Buddha's talking, when you start looking into it more deeply, he's basically saying our minds are riddled with misconceptions, riddled with misconceptions about how the world is. And, at the le and they're at the level of assumption. And he says we're born programmed with these instinctive responses to the world, the responses of this constant attachment, this bottomless pit of neediness that we get born with from past at practice of attachment that causes us to feel a deep, there's this well of dissatisfaction, a belief, utter belief that I haven't got enough, that I'm not enough, which then gives rise to this constant hankering after something. The grossest and most obvious level is the, is the objects of the senses, utterly believing that when I get it, I'll get content and get happy. And then the distress and the stress that then arises the millisecond that attachment doesn't get what it wants. And these two words, attachment and aversion, sound so simple, 
simplistic. But these almost, we could say, certainly you're taking the Buddhist psychological view, are the source, you know, of the distress we all suffer. Because he says we come into this life from in eons of habit, of this deep sense of being separate from, you know, this, this dualistic feeling of being a separate I and this very deep and marvellous teachings in the Buddhist literature on this, coming again from the Hindus, you know. Um, this sense of a separate self and therefore deeply dissatisfied, therefore hankering after something. So spending our lives somehow be believing I'm not enough, believing there's something out there that I'm missing which we have to search for and believing that when I get it, it'll fill the hole. But the way Buddha says is quite literally, we're up, we're up the creek without a paddle. We're looking in the wrong direction. It isn't, it isn't the solution, he says. It's, you know, my mother used to say, all these marvellous sayings our mummies taught us, that the more you get, the more you want. So it's sort of Buddha's really saying that this attachment, this cute, simple word, is this main mental illness we all have. According to, it's a, and it's, just, it's like being a junkie, but it's a question of degree, you know. So the obvious level is, the, is, is, to, is to hanker after the objects of the senses, but then a much more subtle level and much harder to see until we really start doing some inner work is this constant need for, uh, based upon this awful sense of being separate, desperate need to be seen and heard by others. So we can often call that communicating and sharing. It's marvellous, nothing wrong. But the need level of it is why 800,000 people kill themselves. You know, there's despair because we don't have a sense of being a worthy person. And this is really the function of this so-called attachment, which seems so odd, you know, this word because we use it in such a simple way. There's this deep sense of not being enough. So unless we constantly get feedback from others, smiling feedback, you know, Buddhism calls it attachment to reputation. Sounds so strange. But it's almost as if we have no sense of a valid self until I'm reflected back by others. So the good side of this is we have community and we share and it's amazing and can be marvellous. But the downside is we, it's, it's as if we don't think we exist unless we have that, you know, because we don't know how to, 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 to grow our own self on the inside. I mean, this is the way Buddha talks, and I'm sure much of this is familiar to us. It doesn't, Buddha doesn't own this stuff, but it's, it's his, you know, it's a way of talking. And so what stress is, in the most simple way, is when this attachment doesn't, it's, it's every millisecond. It's at the level of instinct, basically. It's an assumption that I haven't got enough, and therefore the assumption is I must get what I want every microsecond. The, the pleasant word from the stranger in the shop, the sun being warm enough on my skin, the cup of coffee just right, the green light, and I'm talking simple things. The, the dishes don't fall off when you're wiping them, you know. As soon as something happens that isn't what this instinctive attachment wants, it bumps up to what's called aversion, which turns into despair, distress, stress or anger. But our tragedy is, you know, and these days how marvellous that we're changing, we weren't educated with internal introspective tools. We only learn about the brain, you know. We didn't learn about our own actual thoughts and feelings. And so therefore, because much of this stuff is so instinctive, we don't notice it until it's too late. You don't notice you can't, that you're depressed until you can't get out of bed one morning. I didn't notice in my childhood that, that I was angry until the words vomited out my mouth, you know. It's a bit late. It's too late. We don't notice we've got a serious problem until we are desperate for, to get to some therapist. But we don't, we don't, anything else in our lives, we don't treat this way. Our bodies, we don't treat this way. Our cars, how bizarre that you do nothing until the, all the tyres fall off and then you better go to the mechanic. We have things called maintenance, you know. We have marvellous systems to maintain our body. We really respect those systems. We, you know, now maybe we're learning a bit but we don't have these techniques that enable us to listen at a much subtler level, which we need to, to the underlying conceptual stories beneath the physical feelings, you know. We wait until we get the physical sign, but it's too late. So even though we tend to think feelings are more subtle than thoughts, what we're talking here and taking Buddhist psychology as our model here, these thoughts go to an incredibly subtle level. They're at the level of instinctive conceptual assumptions, you know. And we have to get down deep into that and unpack those before they get to the level of hitting our body and coming out the mouth and causing all the dramas, you know, or being one of those 800,000 people, 800, people who kill themselves because there's no solution. 
So knowing our own mind, being our own therapist sounds cute, but it's like fundamental job. You want to become a millionaire and have six wives and six husbands? Please, but you've got to be your own therapist. I don't care what you do, be, you've got to be your own therapist. Whatever we do, whether you sit in a cave or, you know, whatever, we need to know our own minds. So each of us has the right and the responsibility, of course, to find the systems at work. I'm just talking Buddhas here. That's the one I'm using, as I said, as my working hypothesis, you know. So this word, this, this word attachment is so fascinating because it's, we use it in such a different way. And of course, if we're, thinking, we're using the Buddha's view here, we can't use our own term because we get very depressed. Because when you start to hear that attachment is the main source of your problem and you use it to call, to talk as a, you use, you use it equivalent with loving your child, well then you're going to be very disappointed and distressed if you hear Buddha says you've got to give it up, you know. But just like any words, when we learn geometry, we learn that's a flat table. But if you study music and you get to play B flat, you better start changing your definitions. You'll get very confused. Or you live in a flat somewhere, you know. They're different, same word, different definitions. Well, the word attachment here for the Buddha is there's nothing nice about it. It's a completely neurotic state of mind. It's coming from this sense of a separate self. Its energy is dissatisfaction. It's frantic. It's frantic to get what this poor neurotic self wants every microsecond. It's, it, it has a panic attack when it doesn't get it, which turns it, that millisecond is the beginning of aversion, which, as I said, when it goes internally, it becomes despair and depression or guilt. When it goes out, it becomes volatile anger. I mean, what else is stress but the meeting, the coming up together of these two? Attachment, not getting what it wants, you know. And tiny things in a day. I mean, I'm talking tiny baby things, not big major events. Just knocking yourself, dropping something, a noise slightly too loud. We get irritated, frustrated, annoyed, upset, we say. Tiny baby words that seem to have no value, but they're all the build-up of this thwarted attachment, <coughs> dissatisfaction coming. And then it comes to a point where it's become really unbearable. It's just a build-up, you know. So you can imagine if we did have this incredible skill, it has to be as quick as Google, I tell you, but develop slowly to notice the second you drop something, <coughs> let's say, which you usually just pay no attention to, but you get annoyed, you swear, you know. Well, right there, you practised getting angry with yourself, you know. So you catch it and you have to go to the opposite. It's okay, it's cool, it's all right to drop something. Right there, tiny little point. Got the build-up of those things until eventually the straw breaks the camel's back, doesn't it, you know. And it doesn't have to be major events that cause us to kill ourselves. <coughs> it's a build-up of small ones, you know. So noticing our mind and the having... They talk, you know, there's a word called patience. We all know this word well. And first using the word attachment, the way Buddha would call, and then using the word anger or aversion, which is the instant response when attachment doesn't get what it wants, even at these subtlest levels, then patience is an, is an amazing state of mind. It's really the one that we're, trying to, that we're trying to practice here. Every time something happens that we don't like, don't want, irritate, annoyed, upset or raging, that's the... Attachment being thwarted, turning into this aversion which builds up the stress, the worry, the anxiety, all the thoughts chatting away, the stories, the hurt, the dramas. So what patience is, is not, you know, we tend to think this word is, you know, kind of, you're gritting your teeth and just hoping this wretched thing will go away. It's really like, for me, it's like suppressed anger, it's like, it's like passive aggression, the way we understand patience. Patience actually is this really courageous state of mind that welcomes the bad thing, welcomes that thing that your attachment desperately doesn't want, welcomes it rather than bashing against it, which is what aversion is, you know, welcomes it. So you drop something, you welcome it, it's okay, instead of the upset or the self-criticism. I mean, my mother used to say, you're your own worst enemy. It's really true. This is the irony of ego for the Buddha, that we loathe this, this neurotic part of us. We don't like ourselves. It's spontaneous when we do something naughty. It's the, again, it's the internalised God, internalised mummy, internalised daddy. <coughs> you know, we, we won't be approved of. We'll get, we'll get criticised. We try to hide our bad things because we're always this assumption too of attachment to other people approving of me is so huge, so instinctive, so subtle that even dropping something it's sort of, you put yourself down for it. It's kind of interesting, you know. So catching a moment and then greeting it. That bad thing that happens. 
greeting it, as opposed to being angry with it, being distressed about it, feeling guilty about it, feeling bad about it, which is another way, and all these various, various words for this state of mind called aversion, which is the response when attachment millisecond by millisecond doesn't get what it wants. So catching our minds, you're noticing, noticing. You know how we, look how we resist loud noises. We resist ugly smells. We don't like, we, it, it arises aversion. Of course, if we're all being politically correct about it, our aversion feels justified, you know? Those wretched cars and all that awful pollution. So what patience is, and this is tricky too, because as, as, as soon as you think you're being patient with something, we think you're being passive. No, passive is not what patience is. You know, I remember Martin Luther King, it really struck me. He said, it's all right to be angry. He meant it's all right to find fault. There is sexism. There is racism. There is this universe, this world is going through suffering. The terrible things do happen all the time. So not being angry, we tend to think it means, oh, well, it doesn't matter. But seeing that there is a problem, let's say in a big world way like this, doesn't mean you have to have aversion to it. Aversion just makes you more stressed and doesn't help you. Your mind gets frazzled. You, you exaggerate the badness of things. You can't make clear decisions. And it causes immense stress. But to see that something is wrong, and then as Martin Luther King said, great, then you say, what can I do to help? That's stupendous. That's compassion. That's like welcoming it. You've got to see it for what it is. Oh, my God, look at that disaster. Look at that oil spill. Look at that this. Look at the war. Look at the violence. You've got to look at it. And the fact is attachment can't bear to look at it. That's why we get so stressed, you know, because attachment's a junkie that only wants nice things. So the compassion in us is there. We see the pain. We see the hurt. And then we, we don't know how to, what to do with this, this anger. But the anger is the response to the neediness to only have nice things. Attachment's a junkie for only nice things. It can't bear the ugly things. So we've really got to watch our minds. It's so tricky because attachment and liking something or loving somebody are completely different. Anger but finding fault are completely different. But we mix them together and we're confused about how to work with these things, you know. So we have to... It's, this is where Buddha's view I quite find interesting, this distinction in Buddhist psychology, this clear distinction between what he would refer to simply as positive and negative states of mind, virtuous and non-virtuous. Don't get moralistic about it. The negative states of mind for the Buddha, this is, and this is crucial to understand if a, Buddha, if a person wants to go into you know, the Buddhist literature on the mind in more depth, because the Buddha's view is, and this is the basis of all Buddhist practice finally, that all these neuroses are not at the core of our being. This is quite shocking actually. In Buddhist psychology, they have this word that says, and I don't, you know, I don't, I need my dictionary to find this word. I don't use it in my daily life. That these neuroses are adventitious. They are not at the core of our being. They're not integral to who we are. Therefore, we can rid the mind of them. And all of Buddha's practice, long term, is heading towards that. That's what nirvana means. Nirvana is a word you can use to refer to your being, your mind, having done this inner work, identified the neuroses at the subtler level and slowly, slowly reconfigured completely and rid your mind eventually of this junk. Now, that's a shocking point because, you know, you go to your therapist in this world, there's an assumption in all the models of our mind that I've heard of that, that you give equal status to anger, love, kindness, jealousy, depression, as long as you've got a reasonable balance, you know. There's no view in our culture, I think, that would identify that anger and jealousy and neurosis and ego and fear can be rid of, can, we, can be rid, uh, removed from our mind. That's shocking, you know. They think you're bizarre if you said this, but that is precisely Buddha's point, which is really quite shocking. So it needs careful looking at, not just saying, oh, that's a ridiculous idea, or isn't that cute? So that means we have to get into the mind to identify precisely, logically, how that is true. And that means we have to get to the level of these subtler conceptual stories, because all of these dramas come down to being conceptual stories deeply ingrained, the Buddha says, we've brought from countless lives of practice. So getting to see, then, these, the characteristics of these so-called negative ones is, is the job and how they're fundamentally different in their character from the so-called positive. So the negative ones are two main characteristics, Buddhist psychology says. One is, and this is pretty evident, you can prove it yourself, they're really disturbing. Check the last time you were jealous, distressed, annoyed, 
irritated, angry, fearful. You don't say, wow, I was jealous yesterday. It was just great, you know. I mean, we just know automatically they're distressing. We know that so automatically we never look at it. So that's one characteristic. And now you check the last time you were loving, kind, forgiving. You know, forgiving's hard work, you know, compassionate. There's a sense of connectedness to others, isn't there? And they're more uplifting. And there's, 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 not, there's no distress there. They might be hard to practice, but there's an openness. And I've been quite literal here. Because the interesting part about the other, the other ones, the negative ones, they've got that characteristic of being very distressing, very disturbing. But this other one, which is the key to really understanding how the mind works for the Buddha, and this is indicated by one of the words used, which is for negative state of mind or, distri or disturbing emotion, is the word delusion. And this is the key point in Buddhist psychology about all these neuroses. They, the stronger they are in our mind, the more it, they distort what's going on in front of us. And it's fairly obvious. If you really are angry with somebody, even if it's your best friend, you calm down later. But look when you're really angry. Don't they look really ugly to you? Or especially your husband who gave you up for a younger version whom you haven't forgiven yet. I mean, you, you know, the, the pain and the hurt of saying that person's name, they appear ugly to your mind. When you're really dying for that delicious chocolate cake, which is attachment, what it does is it over-exaggerates the deliciousness. So this is the key point the Buddha says is why we all go crazy is that these neuroses first have the characteristic of being disturbing, but second are liars, conceptual lies. And their key way of lying is they exaggerate certain characteristics of the person, the thing, the event. And this is all instinctively practiced. Buddha says we come programmed with this stuff from countless lives, you know. I'm just giving you that as a background because it fits with his view. You just don't start fresh in this life and then learn all these old habits, you know. We come programmed with them from countless lives of habit, he says, which is his view of psychology, right? So, and the, so this key one of these, and this is the one of attachment, it, the one that runs the show in day-to-day in -day life, this sense of neediness. It's, got, it's multifaceted in its function, but this energy of it is, like I said before, neediness, dissatisfaction. And so it's kind of desperate, therefore, to get what it wants every second because the assumption is when my attachment gets what it wants, that's called happiness. And the millisecond it doesn't, that's called suffering. And we don't want suffering. So this is where the stress, the meeting of these two, the moment we don't get what we want, that's when the stress begins, you know. And that's when aversion arises. So having this courage to... First, you have to see the thoughts, see the stories, hear them before they pop out. Then greet it. Greet, you know, greet the thing it doesn't want. Pr basically, that's what we're doing is practising reinterpreting. So you see the world is shocking. You see the awful oil spill. You see the terrible racism, the violence, the wars. You've got to look at it. Attachment can't bear to look at it. It's horrifying. But we have to have the courage to see it for what it is. Then, with, without adorning it, without exaggerating, without making it less or worse than it is, we've got to have the courage to look it in the eye and then think, what can I do to help? This is the courage of compassion. Now, the fact is, very often there's not much, and that takes even more courage because poor attachment can't bear to see there's not much you can do. You know? Anyway, blah, blah. <laughs> it's nearly time to go home. So, okay, there's a bit of Buddhism there, a bit of ideas, a few I thoughts. How about a few questions? See what, let me know what you think. Did any of it make any sense at all? Any, anything? Recognise anything at all? Go, oh, yeah, I know that one. So that's Buddhist way of looking at life and changing your mind and understanding the source of your suffering. Yeah. Where are you? Yes. Um, I found what you said about attachment very useful and interesting. Good. I would just like... To understand a bit more about yes. how desire could be described in relation to attachment. Absolutely. That, that would be helpful. 
Absolutely. I think the key to communication here is we've got to get our definitions right. These words, desire and attachment, usually in Buddhist psychology, are referred to as both the same neurosis. But we can see really obviously in our world we use these words in very many different ways, don't we? So we've got to get our definitions clear. You can have whatever definition you like for both attachment and desire, but I'm going to use Buddhas here, and then you can just use other words if you like. But what he's referring to when those words are used is this neurotic neediness, this bottomless pit of dissatisfaction, this low self-esteem, this sense of separateness, the hunger like a junkie to get what I want, and that's the disaster. But using ordinary terminology, you, you, the words they would use in Buddhist psychology for good words would be to an aspiration, to what, or even just, oh, I'd love some chocolate cake, we would say in English. I'd love chocolate cake. So look at how it, that's our normal language and that's fine. So let's say you, you and I go to the cafe and we order our delicious chocolate cake. Now let's see what happens when carrot cake comes. You might go, oh, that's cool, I can handle carrot cake and you proceed to enjoy it. But I might go, excuse me, I ordered chocolate cake and get upset. Well, beforehand, we looked like we just liked carrot cake, like chocolate cake, you with me? But the millisecond my attachment didn't get what it wanted, look what arose. Annoyance, irritation. So my behaviour proved I had attachment. But you don't know it often until you don't get what you want. So the words attachment and desire for the Buddha are used synonymously for this neurotic state of mind. But to want something is perfectly reasonable. To like something. We can, you know, Australians like their Vegemite. You guys like your Marmite. You know, Tibetans like their yak cheese. It's sort of a cultural thing you get used to. So liking something doesn't mean attachment or the neurotic state. Loving somebody, this is an altruistic state of mind. You can have this huge, you can say, I really, oh, you know, desire, you can use it in a good way in our Western world. But I'm using Buddhist psychology here, so it's really important you know what he's referring to. And there's a word that's used synonymously with attachment. But to want something, you've got to want to get enlightened. You've got to want to help the world. This is perfect, you know. The key to its being attachment is if you get stressed out and annoyed and irritated and upset when it doesn't get what it wants. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the key to know if it's a neurosis or something valid, regardless of the word you use for it. That's the key. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm living in... Uh spiritual community yes. and in the morning I sing Teze and I do my meditation yes. and I want to serve my community yes. and then I go to my work and I sit in front of my screen the whole day and gradually I feel depleted yes. and at first it's fine talk with my colleagues but then there's an email and there's a message in it and I get pissed off That's right. Exactly. things like that and That's it right. builds up. That's At the end right. of the day, I'm depleted. That's right, exactly. And I'm in a spiritual community. That's what right. do I do? No, no, precisely. That's right. No, th I understand exactly. I understand exactly. So did you, when I gave a bit of the description before about the mechanics of this process, did you, did you rec recognise what I was saying? I was totally with you. I was yes. so a lot of uh, recognition yes. of what you told me. So I suppose that all we can say, and this is what I think the point is, one, I remember one of my teachers saying, I could tell you about this stuff for a whole year, but until we start, not even just superficially, but deeply going inside, and let's face it, we can't do that overnight. We have to be very patient and humble. So we, there we, here's me living in a so-called, you know, religious, a spiritual life. You are the same with marvellous people around us, all the conducive environment, have our practice every day, and still it's unbelievably hard. And so I think all that points to is the humbling fact that there's lots of work to do. We shouldn't be distressed about it, that it shows how deep it all goes. Rather than, oh, my God, I'm a bad practitioner, it just shows how subtle it really is inside us, how deeply instinctive these ancient habits are. So we need to have patience and humility with it, I think, and just get more courage and know just keep looking. Because the key is to every time you see it arising, you catch it then and turn it around then. That's the real skill. But this is incredibly subtle, incredibly subtle. So the conclusion shouldn't be, which is what we tend to say, oh, I'm not good at it, I'm doing bad, or I should be better by now. Not at all. We just It should show us that this is how deep it goes. I mean, I remember, <coughs> even this, this is another point. <coughs> a friend of mine, a serious meditator, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, you go off and do three-year, four-year retreats. Some people do 10-year retreats. And they're not just sitting there watching their navels. They're doing really full-on detailed work on the mind at this level the Buddha says we can, you know. So this friend of mine, an Australian monk, 
serious meditator, many years, really struggled hard, really did lots of purifying, many, many retreats. And at some point, he said, he was he had certain levels of rage and anger and arrogance that he that he was scared of. He thought, this is insane, you know, after all this hard work. So he went to our teacher, Lama, Lama Zopa, very distressed, and Rinpoche laughed and laughed and said, fantastic, the dirt has to come out. The dirt has to come out. So there's another way, I think, of interpreting if you, you know, you know yourself, if you, if you, you know, you go to the gym, you decide to get fit. Well, honey, you're going to come home with muscles you didn't believe you had. So that's not a bad sign. That pain, if you were sitting watching television and you got those pains, then you are in trouble. But coming home from the gym with that pain, you know it's a good sign. Are you seeing my point? So we've got to have the courage, and this is the irony of ego too and the attachment. It's a junkie for nice feelings, a junkie for things being good. So you really, we need the courage to know if you are working hard every day, you are practising, you are benefiting people, then you're doing an incredible work. I mean, we mightn't be the 1% of the billionaires on this earth, but the 1% of people trying to be better. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I remember Lama Zopa saying, just to have a kind thought on this earth is stupendous. When you see the suffering of most people, the tragedy, the dramas of their lives, you know. So here you are making an effort to be a good person, living in a community that's trying to help the world. Really rejoice. Really rejoice in your good qualities, you know, and, 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 and accept that this is the way it is. And that already can help us calm down. Because the, what's causing this stress is the constant self-criticism. We don't even notice it, though. And an assumption, I shouldn't be like this. Wrong. 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 Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you very much. Good. So you have to be very brave, you know? Because we are doing, you are doing brilliantly. I mean, we don't rejoice. They have this term in Tibetan Buddhism, rejoice. It sounds so cute. We, you, if you wrote down every thought you had in a day, we'd have a book... The central player is I and it's criticism. I'm sorry. Of ourself, forget other people. We very rarely genuinely have a positive word to say for ourselves because we're feeling embarrassed and we think it's arrogant. Excuse me, it's not. It's extremely important to sort of like to, to check, you know, to check up the day, how you went. I've made this, and when, even if you make effort to be kind and you struggled, that's an amazing thing. You're programming your mind in a really good way because everything we do, Buddha says, this is karma. Every microsecond of every thought programs you. So if you're really practicing patience, really practicing kindness, it's going to bring its results. It doesn't just disappear into the sky. So there's every reason to rejoice, you know. Good. Okay. Yes. Have I got this right or am I a complete idiot? Um, four years ago, my wife needed carers. Yes. And we were able to take her out for walks in a wheelchair. May I suggest you put this like an ice cream closer to your mouth? Closer to my there mouth? There you go. Now I can hear you. Oh, you've got a hearing problem, have you? I probably have now. Yeah. Getting old. Well, what I'm trying to say, have yes. I got it wrong or have I got it right? But this has gone on for four years. Yes. And all I can say, I'm absolutely loving it. Yes. So am I missing something? No, I think you, I think it sounds marvellous to me. I mean, this is so how blessed you are that you are loving it because look at, Many people would be in torture, struggling, suffering, annoyed, upset, difficult, panicked, depressed. Yeah. So I have very, very fortunate that you have these marvellous habits in your mind that enable you to be loving it. It's incredible. Well, the other thing is we have the most amazing gang of carers. Yes. And I don't know whether you know, but angelic ends with C. Yes. And carers starts with C. With a C. So I call them angelic carers. There you go. Perfect. And they're so loving. So blessed to have this. And they amazing. not only care for, for mm -hmm. her, but mm -hmm. they're also aware of my needs. There you go. That's right. This is the compassion wing developed, isn't it? Yeah. Marvellous. So, so am I completely stupid? I think, no, I think you can rejoice in your virtue. How incredible. How fortunate that you have, the, that it all works and that you can be feeling good about it. That's yeah. incredible. I, I delight. Amazing. Well done. And your lucky, lucky wife, having such love around her. Well, my father was rather the same. Mm -hmm. he, my 
mother was ill and began to wind down when she was mm. 85, mm. and eventually she dies at 93, 94. Yes. Uh -huh. And I saw what he was doing mm -hmm. as a wonderful example. Wow. He then lived for another eight years until he, he really? was nearly 101. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so fortunate. I mean, so fortunate to have these, just to have even this tendency to want to be this way when you see yeah. the, the awful way that people suffer in the world, you know? Yeah. Very blessed. Amazing. But I think what, I, what I'm learning is what you're saying is mm. what appears to be a disaster. Yes, that's right. Isn't. Is an enormous Precisely. blessing. No, that's the one. That's the real, that's, that's, that's the proof of the pudding of this view that we're talking about. Because yeah. you can look at the same situation of someone else like this who's going for pretty crazy. Yeah. Angry, upset, depressed, everyone's miserable because it's, yeah, so that's the one. It's totally marvellous that you have mm. this. And that's all we have to learn to do. That's, because that's what stops stress. That's what makes the mind happy. And it's the sense of connectedness with others. And it's so blessed that we can do that easily. It's very special. Wow. I rejoice. And every week I'm blessed because the Course of Miracles group meets in my house. Uh huh. Good. Now that's a slight different kind of Buddha. Yes, but I think it's a, it's a great system too. Yeah. Mm. Another way of pre presenting the information, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Rabina, is this. Um, Loving what is. I, I think those words are accurate, yes. But look how difficult it is. I mean, how fortunate we can do it, but this is what we're, we're talking about, yet, yeah, And it can be enormously difficult. And uh, this is I, what I... Anyway, go on, keep going. Yeah, so I get the loving what is. And then there's a bit inside me that says, yes, but... If it was like this... No, that's right. Well, precisely, that's how we are, You know, isn't it? I could... Of course. ...love it a bit more. No, that's right. So then that's OK, you know. The, 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 I mean, there's a there's saying in all the different... I mean, you know, the great beings say things. And the one, the Buddha, the one way he says is, if you can change something, please change it. But if you can't, why worry? And that's the part that's so outrageously difficult. It sounds so cute to say it. And this is where, for me, working with people in prison for 15 years completely blew my mind and humbled me in this way. It was mainly in the States, not much in this country, mainly in the States and in Australia, but especially the States where it's a total nightmare. The numbers, I can't even... It's just unbearable, you know? Um, I read in The Economist that something like the United States has 5% of the world population, but it's got 25% of all human beings in prison on Earth. If you're in prison on Earth, a quarter of them all on Earth live in the States, and they have 50% of all lawyers on Earth. Anyway, it's such a cliché, it's so awful. And the sentencing is like a nightmare. So what happened was, in 94, I was in the States and uh, I was editing a magazine, a Buddhist magazine, and I got a letter from this young Mexican fellow, Arturo, his name was, he told me, he was in California, he told me he was in this top security kind of prison which is so common in all the States now. They call it security housing unit where you're in your cell, 8 foot by 10 foot, with two bunks, 23 to 24 hours a day, you're in your orange jumpsuit, you're allowed to have 10 books, no hard backs because you can whack your cellmate, the inside of a pen because you could use the hard part to stab your cellmate, you don't have any hot drinks, you use you drink, uh, what do they call it? Co we call it cordial. We call it cordial, don't we? Not nice cordial either. Kool-Aid they call it in America. And you just can't conceive of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the horribleness of it, you know, limited so profoundly in your freedom. The noise is like being at a rock concert all day. You never see the sun. You have one hour a day in another cell walking up and down. No air, no... So many people have liver disease, you know. I can't describe. It's like a hell on earth. Hell on earth, OK? So this young man, he told me he was from Los Angeles. He'd been part of the gangs, which is... I can tell you... I can spend hours telling you stories about the gangs. He, uh, since 11, was in gangs, since 12 in prison, then briefly out when he was 16 and then tried as an adult and was given three life sentences. Not for killing anybody because the, the sentencing is so severe and it's mandatory in so many of the states. You can, you can steal a video and get 30 years to life, you know, in a prison in the states. Still, it's, it's beyond bearing. Okay, anyway, these... Um, the irony for me is 40 years ago when I was living in England because my dad's English and I lived in London in the 60s and I was part of my... As I mentioned before, my political activity was um, working with 
the time of George Jackson, the Soledad Brothers, Angela Davis, the Black Panthers, all that stuff. Some of you might remember. And that was my political activity. And we had a group in London called the Friends of Solidarity. So the people I was working with and working for were these people in prisons in California, the blacks and the Mexicans. Well, here I am 40 years later in California, but from a very different perspective, you know. It's so interesting working with these people in prisons. So earlier those days I would have brought guns in and killed people because I have very angry, very easy to be angry, and I thought anger was virtuous, you know. Actually, I always joke, but when I was a Catholic, I sort of divided the world into Catholic and non-Catholic, and sort of the non-Catholics were the problem. Well, I didn't think that way, really. But then I was a hippie in the whole world, all the straight people were the problem. And then I was a communist, all the rich people were the problem. Then I was in the black politics, the white people were the problem. And then I was a feminist, and the male people were the problem. <laughs> so I only had me left, you know. <laughs> By the time I was 31, I had, no, I had exhausted all options. And then I met these Tibetan Buddhists, and they suggested I should look at myself. I thought, what a brand new idea, you know. <laughs> So anyway, that's what's been informing me since then. So, but working with these pe people in prison has been the most amazing experience for me in doing exactly this job. Because when you just listen to some of the experiences of some of these guys, women, men, it's, they're hell on earth. They're nice people, in the, uh, half the time in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, people would write letters, and it's not the psychos, believe me, who wrote letters to us, you know? It was not, there's these human beings in the wrong place at the wrong time who've got 30 year sentences, life sentences, death row, you name it. And so, d giving them these tools, giving them books, taking their phone calls, writing, we had a team of 200 volunteers writing to prisoners, those who wanted. And just for me, it was so incredibly humbling. Because when you're living in these garbage dumps, and you can't, you can't, you can't do anything without permission. You have no right to do anything. The food is beyond disgusting. You have no money. You literally, can you think of living in like as small as your bathroom? If you have a big bathroom, you're living in luxury. A small bathroom, 23 hours a day with one other person. Try and imagine it. That's, and for life, many of them. So then they write letters and they want, and they want. So that they know they can't change anything. And the ones who don't, and that's the point, when you see this, and it's not criticising, those who can't bear the pain of these places, they literally go mad. And you would. So the key, they know vividly, the key to success is you, you've got no choice but to change your mind. No choice. We, we still think we've got freedom. We can be in a shitty relationship, okay? And we keep thinking if only he would change, if I'd only maybe do this and maybe... We live in all the ifs and the buts and the shoulds and if onlys, thinking and hoping it might happen one day. But they, don't, they, they are up against the wall. They don't have a choice. And you either go mad because you're trying to resist it and you, there's, no, there's no benefit, or you finally learn to change your mind. And this is what I'm finding so powerful as examples, you know. There's a woman I read about in Florida, I didn't know her, I read her biography. She was a little hippie with a little hippie husband, little hippie kids hitching in Florida. These two blokes picked them up. The, the police stopped the two drivers. Then these two guys shot the police and then they accused the little hippies and they were arrested. She was on death row over 17 years. The husband got executed for it. I mean, can you imagine that level of pain, you know? That level of suffering and she, was this kind of person. You can, I read a biography, she's amazing. She just didn't have much anger in her nature, you know. But she said, I, I, I couldn't change anything. I couldn't change the police, the judges, the accusers, the prosecutors. And, then, and of course she's on death row, she's seen like an animal. And there she is and she said, but I knew they couldn't take my mind from me. And people are familiar with these types of stories, but it was so powerful for my mind, you know, because you can see the there I am giving them these tools and these are these people actually practicing it. I mean, it was just beyond inspiring, you know, when you just, it's great, to, easy to talk about changing your mind, loving what is, sounds great. But you're living in these hell holes. There's a fellow I know on death row, he's getting ready soon for his execution, you know. There's a movie, where's the table? Where's those movies gone? Huh? Oh, behind there. Sorry, there's a film, this is my advertisement, I'm very sorry. There's a, there's a film there called Chasing Buddha. My nephew, who's a filmmaker, made it years ago and it was at Sundance and things. Anyway, the producers finally gave it back to him. They sat on it for 10 years and we weren't allowed to do anything. And he's offered me 50% of the profit of the selling of it for my projects and things. And so in, it's very moving because part of it is 
in prison in the States on death row, these prisoners, and this particular fellow called Mitch. And he's getting ready for his death date. He said, Rabina, I'm ready for that electric jolt, you know. So there he was in the wrong place at the wrong time on drugs with guns. When you have guns, people die. So, you know, him and his friend, three people died. He's on death row. So he's done all his appeals. His 30 years is nearly finished. It takes that long to appeal your death row. You'd get killed in a month if you didn't appeal it, you know. Cost millions, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. So anyway, he's... He's, again, a typical example. An ordinary guy. He's not some great holy meditator. He's not some great scholar. He's this working-class fellow who, having heard the first talk when I went into the prison, deeply took this on board, you know, and realised something had to change. Well, he couldn't get out of prison, baby, so he only had his mind to change. It's sort of logic in a way, if you hear it. But when it's so huge, when you, when you really are against the wall and you know you can change nothing but your own mind, that's when you really do it. And this is why, in a way, they practice 20 times harder than I do because of this reason. Because I can always skid, you know, I can always go and get my coffee the, te the temperature I want. And I can kind of practice being patient when it doesn't come. I mean, like, wow, you know, they drink cordial all day. And you gotta, I mean, it's just like so incredible. For me, it was so moving and so inspiring. When you can change something, please change it, baby. But when you can't, but our trouble is we think we can all the time. So we live in the fantasy of only we could. And I'm just comparing, say, this guy, Mitch, with another friend I have on death row in a state where they finally quit the death row and now he's got a life sentence. He's been in prison just as long. and He's the sweetest human being, a dear, kind boy. He's black. He's been in prison since he was 17, the wrong place at the wrong time, a good, good heart. But he hasn't still come to terms with this is his reality. And I, I'm not criticising it. He quite, so he's depressed, constantly depressed, endlessly thinking about if only he could find a lawyer, if only he can get this money, if only he can get out. There's nothing wrong with trying to get out of prison. This woman on death row spent 17 years and she finally did get out of prison, but she worked on her mind during it. She meditated, she did yoga. So she came out of that prison broken-hearted. Her kids were lost, the husband got executed, but she was a whole being, a whole person who didn't go mad, you know. There's, I remember this one this, when I read about this woman on death row in Florida and I read at the same time about another guy on death row in Florida who also was innocent, eventually he was proven to be like her, but he went mad. Every day he would scream at the top of his lungs, I did not rape and kill that woman or whatever. And indeed he didn't. But look at the difference, they were both innocent. But one, how fortunate she was, had the skill to not go mad and to accept it and then to do something with it. This is the one. This is real practice. And this is not, Buddha doesn't own this stuff. Any person with a brain knows this. And we admire people like this so much. But this is the key. So forget, wait, don't wait till you get cancer to do this. Don't wait till your husband leaves you for somebody else in a spiritual community. It happens all the time. <coughs> don't, you know, don't wait until you, 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 you're nearly dead. Don't wait until you're sent to prison. Start now with the baby things. Start now with the annoying and the upset and the stress and the tiny baby things. It's too late when you get to the big things, you know, because this simply is the key to having a happy mind and therefore being kind and compassionate and wise and capable of being useful to others, you know. Anyway, blah, blah, again. It's time to go home. It's 20 past nine. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Margot asked me to do a little meditation, but forget it. We didn't. Just do your own tonight. Go home and do your own meditation. Okay. Any more little questions before I finish? Yes. Yes. Mike, please. Live on one. Yes. Sounds like Michael Shaw. Yes. Yes. Venerable Binema, thank you. Okay. Um, I feel a little awkward asking this question with such incredible stories you've been telling. Uh huh. Um, but we're talking about mind this evening, yes. and um, would you agree that the physical universe, yes. uh, the phenomenal universe, and all our feelings about that, our positive and negative feelings, are appearances in mind? That's what Buddha would say, yes. 
I mean, it sounds cheap and easy to say it, but Buddha would literally say, and this is his view of karma from the past, how we even create the cause to come into this world, to have that mummy, to have that daddy, to have bad things in front of us, to have good things in front of us. I mean, it's quite a... In the literature, it goes into great depth explaining logically and literally how we create our own universes, because Buddha does not talk about a creator. That it's a build-up of our own past tendencies that creates the cause for us to, to have nightmare experiences, good experiences, blissful minds, raging minds. So as one... My teacher says everything is our own karmic appearance. Absolutely, Buddha would say that, yeah. We're not to take it lightly, though, because it's quite profound. And um, to, to some extent, uh, I feel that in my own life, if I, if I can see things as appearances in mind, yes. it's sort of easier to change the appearance. That's right, of course, that's right. Yeah, okay. That's all, and that's all part of the approach. Certainly in Buddhism, the more, the less we believe it's all this concrete thing out there that was done to me as a poor innocent victim. I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. That's paralysis, and we'll only ever have victim and paranoia and anger and hurt. But if as soon as we start to own from our own side more, then it already loosens the grip for sure. And would you also agree that I myself? I'm an appearance in mind. Well, everything Buddha would say, now talking the, the wisdom teachings in Buddhism, and no time to talk now, when we, but every, I mean, if the Buddhist philosophical view is that nothing has an inherent nature as this or that, that finally our minds make it that. And not to, it sounds cheap to say it, but it's got massive meaning, you know, and takes a while to internalise it. Everything that does exist, the Buddha would say, exists like that. Everything that does exist, self, you, me, enlightenment, the universe, has this way of existing, of being a dependent arising, coming into, into existence independence upon various causes and conditions, and therefore has nothing from its own side that's inherent or intrinsically this or that. That's how Buddha would say. So as an appearance in mind, I'm not really an entity. No, the Buddha would say you are an entity, but you're an entity insofar as you're not concretely one. Yeah, There's that's a what subtle I meant. I'm not, I'm not a concrete From its own entity. side, not, yeah. stuck with, not stuck in stone, not... not Absolutely like that. This is, I mean, this is, they study this stuff for 30 years in the monastic universities and then go meditate on it for another 30. So, uh, 20, yeah. I don't think I got the 30 years left. To okay, do that. that's right. There you go. <laughs> well, next life, darling, don't worry about it. You can just keep on going. <laughs> aspire, that on your deathbed, aspire to get another decent mummy and daddy and keep on moving. It's okay. You're in control, honey, Buddha okay. says. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. That'll do then. So we'll finish this little 90-minute dream-like event that we had together. And if any of these words have been useful, I've certainly it's been helpful for my mind. Thank you. Some clarity has come. So these seeds have been planted. Buddha says every microsecond or whatever we think and feel leaves an imprint or a seed in our mind. We might remember it, but it's gone in there, you know. So we think maybe nourish these seeds. May we continue to develop our amazing potential. Never forget our amazing potential for our sake and the sake of all these suffering beings in this universe, whom we wish to help. And I'll sing two little prayers that just express this. And the second little prayer, actually, is making the aspiration that compassion grow and grow in the hearts of all. Kewajinyu <laughs> Lama sangge drub kyurne drova chikyang malupa dehi sala kupa Jang chub sem chogren poche, makie panam ke guchig, ke panyam pa me pa yang, gong ne gong du pavashuk. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I rejoice hugely in the work you're all doing. Keep on going and never give up no matter how bad things get. Thank you, Venerable Rabina. So let's have a big applause for Venerable Rabina.